things. Lord, we don't even understand or comprehend how great you are, but yet you chose to have a relationship with us. You wooed us to salvation, and that cost you the precious life of your Son, Jesus Christ. And you're wooing us into glory, Lord, that you want to spend time with us, that you want to have a relationship with us, and help us to always remember that we are part of that family, brothers and sisters of Christ. As we study your word today, Lord, may we open up our hearts and take to, to heart what the things that you have to say so that it will change our actions so that we will be more like Christ as we look forward to the day when Christ returns to carry us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Children's Church. So if you notice on your bulletin, I put multiplication or division up front. I wasn't talking about math. I was talking about the church, the body of Christ, Christians, believers. Where Jesus said, you are my hands and feet. He said, go therefore out and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything. Because see, sometimes we want to just say, oh, let's go present the gospel message. Or sometimes we even say, well, I can't really do that. I'm not equipped or trained. But see, we're supposed to make up disciples so that when Catherine is gone, that I follow in her steps, that Je Jacob follows in her steps, so that she knows without a doubt that when she is gone, that someone will carry on her love, her ministry for the walk for Christ because of the light she's shown because of that passion that she's had. Because they see her faith as real. Not as just something that we go to a church and practice religion, but they see it as a family of God. They see her faith literally in the works that she does. God created us to be in a relationship. And I tell you, when we see the, the joy and miracle <coughs> of birth, Man, we see that. Seeing my grandson and touching him and everything, how? How in the world? How, you, I mean, looking at creation is one thing, but seeing that little child and know that conception started when two fluids came together. That, that's just cr crazy. And this beautiful baby was born out of it. Wow. Thank God that He wanted us to have relationships, that He wanted us to have a relationship with each other, and He wanted us to have a relationship with Him. So what do you think of when you hear the word church? If you Google it, like I said, you'll get a building. <laughs> That's not what it is. This is a church building. This is where we meet together. But church is the family of God. <clears throat> it comes from the Greek word ecclesia which means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes to meet in some public place or assembly. This building, this is not the church, but this is the church. Family, brothers and sisters, those who belong to God, our Father in heaven. For what reason then are we gathered together? Well, let's look. How many times did Jesus use the word ecclesia or church? Do you know? Not a bunch. Two times. The first is in Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, I tell you that you, Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Notice there, Jesus said, I will, not you will, or we will, or programs will, or buildings will, or denominations will. Jesus said, I will. Do what? Build grow, mature, my church, his church. So if it's his church, then what are we? Paul makes it clear, we're his body, he's the head. A body can't function without the head, and the head tells the body what to do, and it needs every part of the body so that it will function properly. And each of you has your part in that. So last week, I pointed fingers, maybe, maybe not, at the older family of God. I use that older, uh, however, with little quotation marks. But I wasn't doing that at all. That wasn't my intentions. My intentions was saying for those of you who are mature, does that sound a little better? That we need to make sure that we do whatever we can to connect so that we don't have division 
Because see, division makes things smaller. That's why I put that up front. But instead, we have multiplication where we grow because they see our faith. They see our desire. They see it's real. They see our actions and they see the light that we have and it glorifies God. And then they say, what, what do you have? I want a part of that. I want to be a part of this. And I simply chose music because music's a hot button in any church, pretty much. The color of the carpet's pretty strong, too. But music is a hot topic also, so I picked that. We do a blended service here rather than doing one or the other so that we don't have any division. But yet, my words may have offended you. And if you have read forward in Corinthians, you'll notice I'm following right after Paul's pattern when he wrote 1 Corinthians. That's why I entitled it A Pastor's Heart. I said last week that I used to think, oh, I had an evangelistic heart. You know, that I wanted to give the gospel message, but then go on, because I didn't want any part of, of the sheep that tend to bite other sheep and bite their, their shepherd also. I didn't want any part of that. I've been friends with many pastors and watched all that. But you know what? We're all sinners saved by grace. It happens. And if you look at your own families again, you have arguments. One of the greatest things about arguments is that you can make up afterwards and show that even through arguments we can love one another. That love is stronger. That bond that we have because of the Spirit of God that is within us is stronger than any argument or division that we should ever have. And learn. We, are not, we, we all think we know everything. <laughs> That's true. I, I, I. But notice in that verse it was I meant Jesus. But Paul goes on to write that if he did offend, he's not really sorry for it either. Because see, the purpose of what he said was to bring you to repentance. And I'll say over and over again what that word is because we get a different thinking of it. We think repentance means, okay, I've repented of my way, so now I'm going to change my actions. But in the New Testament, in the Greek, it meant that I have a change of mind. That's why Jesus said and John said, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I need to change my way of thinking. That it's not all about me. That I can't do anything to get to heaven. Anything else. It's about God, His will, His purpose, and His design. What Christ Jesus did for me. That it's His body, not my body. The church is for His purpose, not my purpose. That instead of saying things like, I'm not getting fed today. That I say, how can I feed? Instead of saying, oh, I didn't really like the music today, how can I contribute more? Or make whoever's playing the guitar or doing the drums feel like a part of the family of God. And that works the same way, piano, organ, or trumpet. Trombone. That's why I was saying I didn't think I had that white Well, I looked at you. So that we all realize that we're all part of the family of God. We all have a purpose. We have been called out to meet in that public place so that the world can see the light of Jesus Christ in us as we love one another and do good works. Because see, they're either going to see the love that you have, the truth, which they see the way, the truth, and the life through you, or they're going to see your hypocrisy. It's black or white. We don't like to think about the hypocrisy, but that's why so many say, I don't want a part of religion because it's become a hypocrisy because I'm more concerned about my ways I'm more concerned about this or that than I am doing God's will and showing love to one another Jesus's first words in the Sermon on the Mount were to love even your enemies right and as we die to ourselves we can see that more and more that that's exactly what Jesus did and that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do the world sees our hypocrisy because we are divided and we lack unity. That's what the whole letter of Corinthians was about. It wasn't about this gift or that gift. It wasn't about this sexual sin or that sexual sin. It was about division in the church. Because they were still trying to live as the world lives and not living as sold out to Christ, as His body, with Him as the head. Still, some complain, whether it's about the color of the carpet or about the programs or about the music. <clears throat> so Paul goes on to say, was Jesus divided? Because that's what it all points back to. 
Was Jesus divided? Was God divided? Was the Holy Spirit divided? Or was there unity that brought about our salvation? That's why I took the time last week to hand out CDs of New Modern Worship. Did anybody not get one that wants one? Catherine, Lisa, and I can get more and more. And it doesn't matter if you're going to be a part of this body or a different body. It means that you are going to be part of the body because you are called to do that. And I will get more. Okay? I have no problem. We're out, so I said it. <laughs> I have no problem buying more and more. And guess what? There are other people that will donate too. Don't worry about it coming out of my pocket or whatever. Because they want to see the unity. That's why we do the movie ministry. I handed Rose a, a video today because she gave it to her sister. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the whole purpose, to minister to others. So that's what we want to do is tell people why we believe and have the sincerity in it rather than our hypocrisy. And if we're not loving one another, if we're not united as a family, then we're showing them our hypocrisy instead of our love. <clears throat> that's a heart that Jesus has given me. I don't have a heart of evangelism anymore. I do have a heart to evangelize, but I have a pastor's heart which says, I want to tell the gospel message, but I want to shepherd and nurture all that I can. I want to be the example that I can. I want to live a life like Paul said, so that you can imitate me because I imitate Christ. And that's what all of us are called to do. Because see, if we don't, we're not going to have this next generation. And This morning we've had the most younger people that we've had in here, period. Praise God! And the more that we love, the more that we let them know that we love them, hopefully the more that they'll see the sincerity, they'll see the way, the truth, and the life. The word pastor in Greek is poimen. It literally means a shepherd, someone who the Lord raises up to care for the total well-being of His flock, the people of the Lord, the brothers and sisters of Christ, the believers. That was the heart and drive behind Paul, and it should be the heart and drive behind all of us. Were there corrective letters that had to be sent out? Yes. Not just from Paul. Look at Peter and James and John as well. And they strove to say, listen, we walked with Jesus. We saw these things. We even did it ourselves. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, we weren't even there. But look what has happened as a result of the power of God that has come upon us with His Spirit. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. Be united. Because you are the body of Christ carrying out His mission here on earth while He's gone to heaven to prepare our home. And one day He will return and take those who truly belong to Him home. Repent of your old way of thinking because behold the kingdom of heaven is here at hand now. <clears throat> We've looked over 1 Corinthians but I want to read it again. 1 Corinthians 1 starting in one, verse 1 through 13. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, made holy, set apart in Christ Jesus, and called to be His holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. If you didn't notice in that verse that I read you where Jesus first mentioned church, He's talking about this universal church. I will build my church. He's talking about every body of believers, every brother and sister in Christ. Regardless of denomination, regardless of location, we are all part of Christ's church. And we'll see in His second example that He brings it local. This is what Paul is writing here. And he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship. That word means intimacy. Like the intimacy of a husband and wife. 
That's the intimacy that we're supposed to have as believers, as brothers and sisters. That we're supposed to have with our family units and then out to our family unit of God, the church. Paul goes on to write in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, that love chapter that gets quoted in so many marriages and everything. But that's the directions for the church for one another. It's not the directions for a married couple. It's the directions for you and I to love one another. <clears throat> Maybe you have the NID, NID, NIV version. But next there's a header that says a church divided over leaders. Like I said, it doesn't matter what the division is, and I didn't even mention the leaders earlier. It matters that there is division. That's why Paul writes this next in verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another. And what you say, that means that there may, must be no disagreements about the color of carpet, about the ministries, about the music, anything else, as long as the gospel message is what is preached. Because the power of salvation is in the gospel message. If we preach Jesus Christ, all the other things don't really matter. They shouldn't be points of division. But instead we should be united. <clears throat> that you all agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you. So he goes even a step further. I mean, how can that be? We can't have no divisions. Things will come up. But just like I said in your own family, if you don't address those things, if you don't love one another and let each other know that you're part of the family, that you're my brother or you're my sister, and there's not anything you're really going to do to get me not to love you, then we can overcome those divisions. Because if we don't, look at some of our own family relationships where we're, we're divided from children. We're divided from brothers and sisters. Because I stood in the way again. I thought I was right. I'm not going to go and, and make reconciliation. But everything Jesus says, it says, I came to die for you to make reconciliation. I came to bring you life. And not just life, but abundant life. <clears throat> that the opposite of divisions, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought, cohesively put back together where there are no rents or tears that are dividing you apart. Now maybe that's taken a long time to come back to that. Maybe you do it right away, but the point is, is that we come back to that cohesiveness. And the picture of a body, again, that everything is functioning properly because my leg laying over here is not going to help me any at all. And so many times we say, oh, I'm just not a part of the body of Christ. Okay? Or, like I said, I'm not being fed, so I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, that's fine, but do you get involved in that body? Or do you have that same attitude that rents you apart from this body? Because, see, God has called you to be in a body. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, divisions, where there needs to be unity. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another I follow Christ. Even there are people saying, oh, I follow Christ, that's what I'm doing. Not if you can't get along with Peter's teaching and Cephas' teaching, because he goes on to say, one plants, one waters. But we're all giving the gospel message. We're all being obedient to be part of the body of Christ. So then verse 13, he says what should hit home. Is Christ divided? If you look at all of those verses, it talks about who we are in Christ and what God did for us through Jesus Christ. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Jesus Christ is mentioned in every verse. His name is not in one. It says Him. And there are different ways that it's mentioned, whether it's Christ, Jesus... Lord Jesus Christ, however it's put, because Jesus is the promised Messiah that came to a dark world who thought there was no hope, that God had forsaken them. But His promises that He wrote all through His, His Word said, I will send a Savior. And then when the Savior come, because I didn't have the kind of Savior I wanted again that fit my needs just exactly, I didn't want to accept Him as being the way, the truth, and the life. 
even though mighty miracles and everything proved that he was the Son of God. I wanted to stay in the dark as Nicodemus was fighting with rather than coming to the light. But the thing is, is we've all got to decide who is this Jesus. Is he is Christ? Is he the Christ, the promised Messiah? And will he be our Lord? And he's not divided. So we can't be divided either. <clears throat> Paul goes on to write in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 8. Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you. Back to that family instance again. We have quarrels, but a dad that wants to lead his children is still going to lead his children. It may come in words. It may come in a pep talk. It may come in... in Threatening words, but still loving words. It may come in discipline. Ooh. But the whole purpose of all of that is to bring a child back to the correct behavior and unite the family so that there will be no divisions. Because the family is what's important, that relationship. The family of God so we can represent our true heavenly Father as children of light. He says, though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. That spanking only hurts a little while, don't you? But when it comes, it hurts. <laughs> I don't like receiving it, and I don't like giving them. Yet, or but, now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to what? Repentance, that change of your way of thinking. For you became sorrowful as God intended. Now this repentance is changing your heart, changing your behavior. And so you were not harmed in any way of us, by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. When I first started pastoring, every pastor that I encountered, free Methodist or otherwise, said at this point, since there's change, you're going to lose people, you're going to have problems, but, but you've got to focus on God, not your plans of how to fix things, but God to, to walk this through that it's His church again. That scripture comes back to mind. But they said, get rid of all the hymns. Because see, statistically, the church that holds on to their traditions and hymns dies off as the people that hold on to their traditions and hymns. Does that make sense? And there's no offense in that statement. I said no. I'm not going to do that. The hymns are a part of worship. They're a great part of worship. They have great lyrics. But I said, we're going to bring in a blended service. We're going to do both. We're not going to just change for this reason or that reason. And it's worked well. I'll say this right now. This is one of the most loving United Churches that I have ever been in. The most. But there are still divisions. Come on. Whether you're the most loving family that looks great out there, when your doors are closed and everything else, there's still divisions. Don't, don't say there's not. So that's what I was addressing as Paul was addressing this. Because I do see our love. I do see our unity. And I do see, and it... Wow! My God, I do see that He is calling younger people back to His church. If you look again, it is happening. Maybe it's happening because He's coming soon. Maybe we have less time. What I do know is that we're one day closer to Jesus' return than we were yesterday. And we need to be serious about our faith. I could give you, I'm going to give you two reasons why younger believers, the next generation, however you want to say it, won't come if there's not contemporary music. Okay? They might come... But they're used to doing things this way. And I'm used to doing things this way. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Right? Okay? So they may come and they may participate in the hymns and stuff, but if they go out and in their car stick into modern worship and things, wouldn't it be nice if you were a part of that? That's why I did what I did. And some of you have even said, hey, yeah, we listen to it when we're in the car. Uh, I got another thing that said, hey, can you play us a song here and there so we can hear the radio version and see it here and go with the words? The thing is, is it's going to be played a little differently. But what I saw was people who said, yeah, yeah, we want our children to come. 
Yeah, we want to reach out. Yeah, we don't want our traditions and things to kill us. And again, I'm only using music as one thing. Let's go with the pew color if we want to. But the biggest dividing thing in churches is their music. Okay. They will come, potentially, but they won't accept necessarily your way of doing it. And if you continue to say, well, when, when I was your age, we played football this way. And they say, well, you know, now, since there's so many injuries and kickoff returns and stuff, we put the ball out on the 25-yard line. Well, that's just retarded. I, but, that we didn't do it that way when I'm, or we come together and say, huh, okay, well, that's the way the football rules are now. Do you know that? Did you know they kick from the 25 and pull it out to the 25 now instead of the 20? I didn't until the other day. I was like, what are they doing? I had no idea, and this has been going for a few years, right? Okay, this shows you how far off the times I am and how much I watch football. But things change. Our younger generation changes, and it changes more and more as it goes down. And if we don't learn to be united with them, we will be divided from them. Do you get my point? Uh, the answer to the music problem in most churches is this. Two services. Isn't it? It's not because they had so many people coming that they went to two churches. Don't fool you. The populations might have been, or tendencies may have been going up, but the thing is, I don't like it this way. I don't like it this way. We're not going to come together. We're going to be divided instead of united. And it does work both ways. There's two sides of the coin. So I'll point my fingers at some younger ones now. Sorry for the first time of the year. Even you. You look sharp today, buddy. I'm talking about the little man. <laughs> are we going to be united or are we going to be divided? Two services. Who goes to each service? Oh, what are the two services? Let's label them. Traditional and contemporary. Okay, now let's label them. Older. I put older, not old, okay? <laughs> Younger. Why? Because your church is divided and there should be no divisions among you. But instead, you should be perfectly united in mind and thought. Why? Because we're the body of Christ and we're to bring God glory and honor. We are Jesus' church, not our church. Not for our glory, but for God's glory, that our light will shine and others may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Pretty simple, but yet so tough. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1.10, and I'll read the NLT, because I don't have a problem with which version I read either. I'm not divided about that. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Christ in there, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Uh-oh, it put church. Rather be of one mind united in thought and purpose. A body has a purpose. It does what my mind, my head tells it to do, or it doesn't function properly. So let me ask you one more question. That two-service divided church, what's going to be like in 20 years? No communication. Is this church going to be here? Probably not. Yeah. What? It'll, it'll be there, but it'll be from the other side. This church probably won't be here. This church may be. And there may be a new, different style. And they may be the older ones that don't want to get along with these because it's easier to do that. But it's not what we're called to do. Love is a choice. You know that from your family unit again. There are plenty of things that should drive you to hate rather than love in your own family unit, but you don't because you're part of the family. You continue to love because they're your children, your brothers and sisters. Hello! We're all part of the family of God. Second reason that, that, that 
that divided church won't work. God doesn't grow a divided church. He's not present in it. We can sing our praises and everything else, but if we're letting our sin keep us from Him, we're not in a right relationship with Him. And if we're not in a right relationship with Him, we're never going to be in a right relationship here. Plain and simple. So I gave you two reasons. Jesus used the word church only two times too. <clears throat> the second time was church discipline. <laughs> Imagine that. And on a local level. <clears throat> the first time was Matthew 16, verse 18. It says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The second is two chapters later. Matthew 18, verse 17. If they still refuse to listen, he who has ears, let him hear. Tell it to the church. Okay, that can't be the world church because I can't go all over telling this discipline act. It's got to be the local church. And if they refuse to listen to even the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, I'm not going to go way off into things, just simply the two usage. The first is a worldly, and Jesus says, I will build my church. That means that the church also is a local body. And in that time... In Jesus' days, it was local family units. So when we do have a small church, don't worry. There's a lot of benefits there to that church that we are in each other's business more so that we can love and support them, if you remember any of the video, that we can be there in the good times and the bad times. Because when you're talking 2,000 people, how can you be if you're in a mega church of that size? So the little church is a great thing, and it follows a biblical pattern again. But there also has to be the unity if there's not, where Jesus talks about it in a second, then we have a problem and it needs to be addressed. Because God doesn't want disunity in His church. It wasn't just Paul teaching that, because he was teaching the words of God. <clears throat> I'm going backwards, Diana. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 and 42. Let me make it real simple. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, these religious experts in one area, the Pharisees got together. Here's another religious group that should have seen the truth but didn't. Nicodemus was part of that and still in the darkness. Even though he came out and said, Lord, teacher, we know that you are a mighty man from God, but I don't really want to accept you as the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. Because it can't be because you're not what I thought you would be in either aspect. <clears throat> One of them, an expert of the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest. And the second is like this. Love the enemy thing fits in here even. Hmm. Love your neighbor. We'll get to the enemy part later. As yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he really? I added really in. Because that's what it all boils down to. Do you accept this gospel message? Is it the power of salvation that leads to eternal life? Or is it foolishness? Because I don't want to choose this part and stuff. I, I, I want the fire insurance, but I don't want the family. Because there's families a lot of trouble, a lot of pain. Or do I want to be reconciled to one another? Because that's what I'm going to be doing in glory anyway and honoring and praising my God for the things that He's done. So if my words did offend anybody or anything, get over it. It was to draw you to unity. You like that, Hannah? <laughs> so that we are all part of the family of God. And I am so glad to see some newer, fresher faces. It does my heart as a pastor so blessed. Now, how many of you have ever been to a family reunion or a family picnic? Put your hands up. We have one this afternoon called Potluck. Ooh! 
It's when the family meets together and has fellowship and everything. And then we talk about business and stuff too. We're going to talk about a Good Friday service and some Easter baskets and different things. So please come if you can. Yeah, I used to hate going to family reunions. Had to kind of drag me there. But once I got there, you know, I left away refreshed and saw people that I hadn't got to see and discuss things that I wouldn't have, that I've missed out on other way. Because, see, they were all part of my family. And that's who we are, the family of God. Father, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the example of Jesus, his teaching. We thank you for Paul's love of the church. And, Father, we just thank you for this church. We thank you for this body of believers. Lord, may we be a light unto the world. May we stamp out any divisions. And may we live unified to bring glory and honor to you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.